Now let's take the techniques we've been practicing for solving equations and extend them to slightly more challenging problems. In this section, we're going to do several examples of different types of equations to solve. So let's start with the first one. Let's solve the equation x plus 6 quantity squared equals 6. What's nice about this equation is, much like the way we were solving in square root property, we have an isolated perfect square and a constant on the other side. So we can go straight to square rooting both sides, putting a plus or minus on one side. The square root now with the square will cancel, and the square root of x plus 6 all squared just becomes x plus 6. The square root of 6 doesn't simplify, so we'll leave it as plus or minus the square root of 6. The last thing to do to isolate the x is subtract the 6 from both sides, and we write the answer with the negative 6 in front, and then plus or minus the square root of 6. Okay, for our second example, I want to compare this problem to the previous one. x plus 6 quantity squared equals 6x. Now in this problem, I cannot square root both sides here like I did in the previous problem because I have an x on the right hand side as well as the left hand side. So things won't simplify as nicely as they will here. So because of this x on the right hand side, I need to unfortunately multiply out the x plus 6 quantity squared. And when I do that, when I do x plus 6 and x plus 6, I've got x squared plus 6x plus another one plus 36 equals 6x. So x squared plus 12x plus 36 equals 6x. Now I have a quadratic equation, and the best way to solve that is to get it equal to 0. So we'll subtract 6x from both sides, leaving us with x squared plus 6x plus 36 equals 0. Okay, so I want to see if this factors. So I'm looking for two numbers that multiply to be 36 and add to be 6. So of the numbers that multiply to be 36, 1 and 36 2 and 18, 3 and 12. So far, none of those could ever add or subtract to be a 6. Uh, 4 and 9 and 6 and 6. So even though there are a lot of factors for 36, none of the pairs of factors will ever add or subtract to make 6. So I can't factor it, so I'm going to use the quadratic formula. So when we use a quadratic formula, we'll have x equals negative 6 plus or minus the square root of 36 minus 4 times 1 times 36 all over 2 times 1. And that's going to simplify to be 36 minus 144 all over 2 which is the square root of negative 36 goes into 108 three times, which is great because that's a perfect square. So we've got, let me scooch this up just a little bit. We've got x equals negative 6 plus or minus 6i times the square root of 3 all over 2. Okay, so just as a quick recap, 
we took out the negative in the square root, made it an i. Uh, we found the biggest perfect square, which was 36, that goes into a 108 evenly and goes in three times. The square root of negative 1 is i, the square root of 36 is 6, and the square root of 3 is too small, so it just stays square root 3. Finally, for reducing purposes, the 6, the 6, and the 2 that are all outside the square root sign, if they are all divisible by the same number, then we can reduce. And since we can divide each one of them by 2, I can reduce all of those by 2. So we get x equals negative 3 plus or minus 3i root 3. Cool. Okay, let's try a couple more. So in this third example, let's solve x cubed plus 125 equals 0. And then right after that, we're going to solve x cubed plus 125x equals 0. Okay, solving the first one, x cubed plus 125 equals 0. Be very careful. If we were to move the 125 over to the other side and take the cubed root of both sides, it would only give you the real number answers and you wouldn't get any of the imaginary answers. So what we need to do here is to factor. Fortunately, this factor is using the sum of cubes. So this is x cubed plus 5 cubed. And that factors to x plus 5 times x squared minus 5x plus 25. I'm using the sum of two cubes formula. Now, we can try but the x squared minus 5x plus 25 will not factor any further. It's tempting, it looks like it should, it does not work. So instead, we're just going to take each factor, set it equal to 0, and solve. So x plus 5 equals 0, and x squared minus 5x plus 25 equals 0. Well, the first one's nice and easy. x equals negative 5. The second one, because it doesn't factor, we need the quadratic formula. So we'll get x equals 5 plus or minus the square root of 25 minus 4 times 1 times 25 over 2 times 1. So that's going to give us x equals 5 plus or minus the square root of 25 minus 100. or 5 plus or minus the square root of negative 75 over 2. Now just like in the last problem, I'm going to break apart that negative 75 to be negative 1. 25, because it's a nice, big, perfect square that divides into 75. And 3, all over 2. So our answer is x equals negative 5 and x equals 5 plus or minus, let's see, the square root of 25 is 5, the square root of negative 1 is i, the square root of 3 stays, and then all over 2. And this doesn't simplify any further because 5, 5, and 2, the numbers that are outside of the square roots, they don't divide by the same thing. Okay, so now we have not just the real answer, negative 5, that we would have achieved by just moving the 20, 125 over and taking the cubed root, but we also have the two imaginary answers that go with it. Okay, let's see what adding an x after the 125 does to change our problem. So it still factors, but we have to pull out a greatest common factor first. So there's a greatest common factor of an x, leaving us with x squared plus 125 equals 0. And setting both of those factors equal to 0, we get x equals 0, and x squared plus 125 equals 0. So this is certainly our first answer. Now, x squared plus 125 equals 0 does not factor. We can move the negative 
125 to the other side, so we can take the square root of both sides. Don't forget your plus or minus sign. And we have x equals plus or minus the square root of negative 125. Just like we did this last one, the negative 75, we're going to pull out the negative. 25 also goes into 125. It goes in five times. So we have plus or minus the square root of negative 1 times 25 times 5. The square root of plus or minus, the square root of 25, I'll write first, is 5. The square root of negative 1 is i, and the square root of 5 stays. Okay, so pay a lot of attention to subtle differences in the questions. Just because something looks like, let's say, a sum of cubes, adding an extra x into one of our factors completely changes that. Okay, let's try a couple more. For our next problem, let's solve x to the 5 halves minus 3x to the 1 half equals 0. Now, the first thing that I notice is it is already equal to 0, and there are x's in both of these terms, which means I have a greatest common factor. And we practiced greatest common factors like this in the previous videos for factoring. We're going to take out the x with the smaller exponent. So since 1 half is smaller than 5 halves, we're going to factor out the x to the 1 half. Also, when we factor these out, remember, we're subtracting exponents. So 5 over 2 minus 1 over 2 is 4 over 2, which is 2. And then when we take the x to the 1 half away from 3, x to the 1 half, we just have 3. Great. So now we have x to the 1 half times the quantity x squared minus 3. Setting both of those factors equal to 0, we can solve them pretty easily. If x to the 1 half equals 0, that means x must equal 0. And x squared, x squared minus 3 equals 0 means x squared equals 3. And when we square root both sides with our plus or minus on one side, we have x equals plus or minus the square root of 3. Okay, so always check for those GCFs. Let's do another example that's similar, but not the same. So let's solve x to the fourth minus 5x squared minus 36 equals 0. Okay, similar to the previous problem, this does factor. It just does not have a greatest common factor. So we'll factor this. If you want to do the problem actually exactly like the previous ones we did in our factoring homework, you can let r be x squared so that r squared is x to the fourth. And if I move this down a little bit, give us some room here, we could rewrite that r squared minus 5r minus 36 equals 0. And looking for two numbers that multiply to be negative 36 and add to be negative 5, 9 and 4, where the 9 is negative and the 4 is positive, would work great. So we would have r minus 9 and r plus 4. If we did that substitution with the r's like we did in our factoring homework, then we would have to go back at the end and say what r was. r was x squared. So this is x squared minus 9 and x squared plus 4. Now I bet many of you can go from the, factoring, the factored out version here, the question, all the way to x squared minus 9 and x squared plus 4 without doing this green substitution in the middle. And that might be true for this problem, but in the next problem I do with substitution, you might find that you need the substitution work done here, just like in the factoring homework. Okay, 
I'm going to finish this problem here. Um, the x squared minus 9 we can factor, so x plus 3, x minus 3, but the x squared plus 4 doesn't factor any further. We can still set everybody equal to 0, though. So x plus 3 is 0, x minus 3 is 0, x squared plus 4 is 0. So we have x equals negative 3 and positive 3. When we say x squared equals negative 4 and square root both sides, we have x equals plus or minus 2i. So plus or minus 2i and plus or minus 3 are our four answers. Okay, let's do a few more. So for our seventh example, let's solve x to the 2 thirds minus x to the 1 third equals 12. Okay, the first thing I'm going to do is get 0 on one side, and I'm going to subtract 12 from both sides. So x to the 2 thirds minus x to the 1 third minus 12 equals 0. And very similar to the previous problem, I'm going to do a substitution because I notice that 2 thirds is double 1 third, and then there's no coefficient, or there's no uh, x's with exponents on the other, on the last term. So the substitution I'm going to make is r equals x to the 1 third. And I notice that r squared is x to the 2 thirds. So this becomes r squared minus r minus 12 equals 0, which factors very nicely to r minus 4, r plus 3 equals 0. So my two answers right now are r equals 4 and r equals negative 3. But I need x's. So this was x to the 1 third equals 4 and x to the 1 third equals negative 3. And the way we get rid of a 1 third exponent is we raise both sides to the third power so that 1 over 3 and 3 over 1 cancel we just have x equals 4 to the 3. 4 times 4 times 4 is 64. OK, let's try that again with the other one. The way we make a 1 third exponent reduced to a 1 is we multiply by 3. So raise that to the third power. And then do the same thing to the right-hand side. So raising x to the 1 third then to the 3 makes the 1 third and the 3 cancel to a 1, leaving us with just x. And negative 3 times itself 3 times is negative 27. Great. We're going to practice some more examples of substitution in the following section in 1.4. So I'll leave that uh, extension for that section. Now I want to solve a couple of literal equations. A literal equation is kind of what I call alphabet soup equations. There's a lot of variables and we're just isolating one of them. So in this equation we're going to solve for b and the equation is 2 over a minus 3 over b equals 1 over c. For this particular problem we want to clear our fractions. And in order to clear the fractions, we need to find the least common denominator. The least common denominator is a, b, c. And just like we were doing in the previous problems, we're going to multiply by a, b, c, both sides. And then reduce. So in the first one, a's reduce, and we're left with 2, b, c. In the second uh, term, the, let's see, the b's reduce, and we're left with 3ac. And in the uh, third term, the c's reduce, and we're just left with a and b. OK. OK. One other thing to note, when we're solving for b and we have other variables, so I'm happy with the equation now because it doesn't have any denominators in it, 
But when I'm solving for b and we have other variables, you want to get all of your b terms on the same side. So let's subtract the 2bc from both sides. That way we have negative 3ac equals ab minus 2bc. So all of our b terms are on the same side. The reason that's a good thing to do is now we can factor out the b. It is a greatest common factor. So that's going to look like this. Negative 3ac equals b times the quantity a minus 2c. The last thing to do then is divide both sides by the parentheses, a minus 2c. And we're left with b equals negative 3ac over a minus 2c. Let's try one more of these literal equations before we finish the video. So in this last example, I want to also solve for b. I'm going to make it look very different. bx squared minus 2bx plus 5 equals 0. Now keep in mind here, we're solving for b, not for x. This example is meant to be, confusing is not the right word, <laughs> that it is meant to make you really think. If we were solving for x, having an x squared, a 2bx, and a plus 5, we would do the quadratic formula. Since we're solving for b, the b is not being squared, I'm going to do the same thing I did on the previous example. Everybody with, an x, or with a b stays on one side. So b squared minus 2bx, and we're going to move the term without the b to the other side, negative 5. Factor out the b. We have x squared minus 2x equals negative 5. And then finally divide by x squared minus 2x by the parentheses, x squared minus 2x. So we have b equals 5, negative 5 over x squared minus 2x. Okay, I do want to do one last equation. I want to solve for x, bx squared minus 2bx plus 5 equals 0. So you can tell the difference. So solving this one for x, this will need the quadratic formula because I have no idea how to factor this <laughs> with those b's and the 2 and the 5. So in the quadratic formula, the a would be the first term, first coefficient, b. b would be the negative 2b, and c would be 5. So x would be 2b plus or minus the square root of 4b squared so our middle term squared minus 4 times a times c. So 4 times b times 5, all over 2 times a, which is b. Cool. OK, we've got x equals 2b plus or minus the square root of 4b squared minus 20b all over 2b. Okay, now inside the radical here, our radicand does simplify. Uh, don't think of it as one of the reasons I chose this example. You're not factoring out a greatest common factor like maybe you were over here. No, you could, like just like over here, you were not taking out the greatest common factor. You were just taking out what you needed. You just needed a b to come out. Same thing over here. I don't want to take out the greatest common factor. The point isn't to factor. The point is to simplify. 
And a perfect square, specifically four, goes in to both of those terms. So I can factor out the four, leaving us with a b squared minus five b all over two b. So this would be two b plus or minus two times the square root of b squared minus five b over two. Okay, I wanna do some reducing and then I wanna talk about our answer. The two b, the two and the two all reduce by twos. <laughs> so we have, if I scooch this up just a little bit, our answer is x equals b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 5b all over one that I don't have to write in. Okay, one quick thing to point out. In this square root, the b squared doesn't simplify because it's only part of one term and the other term does not have a b squared in here. So unfortunately, I can't break up square roots over addition and subtraction. So I can't simplify this b squared. If this were not a 5b, if it were a 5b squared, then I could. So just as a quick recap, if the variable you're solving for is not the variable that's being squared, you can just isolate it on one side, fact, get all of the terms that have that variable in, factor them out, factor that out as a GCF, and then uh, continue isolating your variable. If, you're on the other hand, you're solving for x, and x is being squared, and then a, a linear term, and then a constant term, then you can use either factoring or the quadratic formula to solve. Great couple of examples.